Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Lori Norton Moffat, Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Founded in 1969, the museum is dedicated to exploring the artist and his legacy and houses the world's largest and most significant collection of Rockwell's works, including 574 original paintings and drawings and the Norman Rockwell archives of more than 200,000 items. Lori Norton Moffat is a leading Rockwell scholar and over recent years has broadened the vision of the museum to include traveling exhibition programs. She has also positioned the museum as a leading organizer of illustration exhibitions. She's generously agreed to share some of her insights with us. I'd like to thank you, Lori, for joining us today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Norman Rockwell looms very large among illustrators in the United States, but he has had a trajectory in terms of the public's perception that has shifted over the years and has, has really come, in, in a sense, full circle. Talk a bit about that idea of, of Rockwell as an artist, as an illustrator, and how those perceptions have evolved uh, through his life and after his death. I think Norman Rockwell is a very interesting artistic figure. Uh, he may have been the most popular artist among the American people during the 20th century. He was a beloved figure. And simultaneously with that, the art world tended to disdain his work. And the art world representing, I think, a fairly small percentage of the population relative to the viewers who saw his work on the covers of the Saturday Evening Post and in all kinds of other media and magazines from the early 19-teens right up until the late 1970s. And there was a period of time early in the century, really beginning around the time of the uh, Great Armory Show in 1913, where art forms began to diverge and narrative realism uh, became the sort of antiquated European tradition and the modernist movements were coming of age. And with Picasso's Cubism and the movement of these right. movements into uh, the United States, uh, artists heading to Europe to study these new styles. Uh, by the time we see Rockwell really hitting his stride in the 1950s, painting the wonderful iconic scenes of American life, we also have the phenomenon of Jackson Pollock and abstract expressionism right on into Andy Warhol and pop art and uh, all that was emerging in the 60s and 70s. So around that time, Rockwell was tremendously out of fashion in the art world, and yet he was still beloved as an elder statesman, uh, I think, by the American people, painting the iconic civil rights movement paintings, the problem we all live with that chronicled the journey of Ruby Bridges to uh, integrate the first school in New Orleans, uh, the flights to the moon, the Peace Corps movement in the 1960s founded by President Kennedy. So he kept his finger on the pulse of both current events and I think the American family and the American psyche. And so there was this great divergence between what the art world was celebrating and what the sort of general public uh, was responding to in terms of art that appealed to them. So his craft wasn't dismissed, but his work product seemed to be outdated. His, his techniques were seen to be passe, but he never lost his popular appeal. That's right. Uh, he remained tremendously popular and at the same time was completely out of step with what was going on in the art world. And I think what's interesting today, uh, here we are in uh, 2011, and art forms are weaving back together. We're seeing the artists being free to choose to paint narrative realism, to be realists, to paint uh, abstractly or create um, contemporary art forms that, are, that really spin around an abstract idea. And in many ways, I think uh, artists had to be in the closet, if you will. If they liked Rockwell, they couldn't admit it for a good part of the 20th century. It was a career killer. And I've had so many artists to tell me today how much they love Rockwell and how they were inspired by him. And they're so relieved that they can say so now. What was his attitude toward that perception in the, in the art world? Because many people, when they are rejected by their colleagues, um, as to a certain extent he was, um, can become embittered and, and lose their optimism. 
think because from a very young age he held the profession of illustration as a noble pursuit, uh, he never veered off of that track. He tried. He, he experimented with some uh, abstraction. He went to Europe to study in the 20s and 30s and uh, felt that Picasso was one of the greatest artists of all time, but he always stayed with what he knew. He, he stumbled at various times during his career. He suffered from depression at uh, certain points. After his divorce in the 1920s, he really went into, that's when he went to Europe to try to refresh and study. Uh, when his second wife, Mary, died very suddenly and tragically in 1959, uh, he really suffered for a period of years, went into psychoanalysis and um, enrolled in a sketch class in Stockbridge to just be freshened up and paint with other artists. But he came back to do 14 years of uh, paintings for Look magazine that looked at the current events of the day and really in many ways left a legacy of American culture and American history and American social history of the 20th century that would be relatively hard to discern from the abstracted art forms that are also such treasures of that period of time, but we now have a greater understanding of what life was like and what the impact of uh, technology and invention and transportation and war and uh, difficult periods of history in our nation like the civil rights movement and how that affected the American people. And it's fascinating how he stayed on top of so many different trends. He seemed to remain very current uh, within his form and, and he seemed to be somebody who embraced change without shying from the more controversial aspects of that change. You go from paintings that show the first automobile, the advent of the telephone in the home, electric lighting and its impact on American homes, on through train travel and the first ride on an airplane, right on up to uh, the space flights to the moon. It was an extraordinary century and Rockwell uh, just you know, came on the highway at the right time. He was able to dovetail with all that was exploding with change and invention in that century and put his craft to work of seeing it and having the ability to paint it. So this is art not for art's sake. It's, it's not art that speaks just to the arts community. It's art that actually speaks and interacts with people. That's what it was intended for, and of course that's what illustration art really is all about. Uh, Rockwell became, I think, something of a phenomenon in the 20th century and really stood as on the shoulders of so many other important and wonderful illustrators. Uh, his great hero was N.C. Wyeth and Howard Pyle. Uh, he was said to have walked down the street following J.C. Leyendecker in New Rochelle, trying to mimic his walk and strut down the street to uh, emulate him. He was also very aware of the art history traditions that went before him, and one of the wonderful collections we have from his studio are his art prints from museums all around the world. And so he had many, many prints from the uh, Northern European Dutch genre painters. He had prints from museums in Russia. He had been to all the great museums in Europe, and he had studied these old masters. And you see those techniques reflected in both his painting style and sometimes in the composition of a work. I think he had some fun making puns. He painted the great, strong Rosie the Riveter yes. uh, in the position, the seated position of the prophet Isaiah from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. If you look closely, you'll see many of these parallels in his work. And I think he was just having fun with that, um, wondering if people would catch the reference. and, and maybe suggesting I can paint like these wonderful painters before me. As you uh, shape this institution, of course, in, in the early days, it was shaped by Rockwell and his wife uh, himself. I think one of the fun things about this museum is it wasn't founded to honor Norman and Molly Rockwell. It was founded to save a 200-year-old federal period home from being torn down in Stockbridge. And Norman and Molly were two of the citizens that donated a little money, and they needed something to do in this uh, saved building that became oh, an historical society. And Norman Rockwell said, well, my paintings just came back to me from the publisher. Curtis Publishing had just closed, and he said, if you'd like to put them on view, I'd be happy to lend them. 
And so just like his popular appeal in the magazines, Norman Rockwell Museum is a museum that grew by public demand and popular appeal. As word of mouth spread, people just flocked to come see the original paintings. And I think this was one of the aha moments of the museum experience is prior to that, they had only seen his work in reproduction. Now, the magazines, a Saturday Evening Post, a good sized journal, but still maybe 12 inch high. Yes picture and when you walk into the Norman Rockwell Museum or experience his art in any collection or any museum, you'll see these life-size canvases, four and five feet tall, uh, some of them, the horizontal pieces, six and seven feet long, and they're just beautifully painted canvases and they just reach out to you and grab you and it's one of the transformative experiences going to see his work in a museum is um, how moving they are to people. How do you shape the exhibition uh, programs of the institution to keep it vital and to continue that dialogue with the public that started right at the very beginning? Yes. Well, we uh, quickly outgrew that small house we were founded in, and we built a new museum building that opened in 1993, one of the early waves of new museum construction uh, designed by Robert A.M. Stern, and still quite small and intimate to keep the homey feeling that one experiences when you visit. But at that time, we broadened the mission of the museum and the exhibition program to put Norman Rockwell in the context of American illustration. And so we now present artists and uh, illustration art from the Civil War period to the present day. Uh, our summer exhibition this year will be on animation art and really looking at the creative process from illustration to uh, the tablet digitization to create an animated film. We've done graphic novel exhibitions as well as presented the Golden Age illustrators, J.C. Leyendecker and Maxfield Parrish. Uh, we'll be presenting a Howard Pyle show oh, uh, next year. So we work with many, many contemporary illustrators, and I think this keeps the museum vibrant. We have hundreds of illustrators who have either presented uh, in group shows or some in single shows or presented programs at the museum. And our Center for Illustration Scholarship, the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies, uh, really looks at the impact of illustration art, how it both reflected the culture and history of our nation and how it shaped it. Because prior to television, and of course today the internet, illustrators were the purveyors of fashion. They were showing people what the current fashions were. They were telling people what to wear. They were identifying what was important. And they were celebrities. They were known by name, which is very different from the way it is today. Yes, well, particularly prior to, to uh, color photographs. Yes. Uh, how do children um, experience the museum? Do they experience the museum in a way that that is kind of, oh, mom, we have to go to a museum. Oh, dad, you know, why are you dragging us to a museum? How, how does that work? Well, I think one of the things we try to do is make museum going fun for children. And we have an art classroom. We have a, just a creativity center where they can make art. Parents can read books to children and make the connection between the illustrations in the book and paintings on the wall. But one of the things children love about Norman Rockwell's art is they can see themselves in it. They can identify with it. They can take the treasure hunts. They can look for the really little children. They will look for all the objects in the paintings and delight in finding them. And so there are many people who visit the museum with nostalgia in mind because it reminds them of their growing up or it reminds them of life and family moments. But we also see the freshness that people, new generations, children and uh, young adults bring to the museum and when they see Rockwell's work for the first time. And it's really one of the things that has delighted me over the years as I've uh, grown in my career and from the, the young college student I was when I started there to a parent and uh, look, going through the passages of life and I think that that's one of the things Rockwell keyed into so beautifully. You can come back to a painting when you're a generation older and see something different in it than you appreciated when you looked at it at an earlier time and as Rockwell grew and aged and tackled subject matter that became both more sophisticated and also caught his eye from a different point in his life, he was able to translate that into canvas and 
that continues to appeal to people of all ages and all cultures today. So you refer to your career. Talk about, about your journey to this point. How did you arrive here? Well, I've had a long tenure with the Norman Rockwell yes, Museum, have. and I think uh, one of the fascinating things for me is how many doors and windows and worlds Norman Rockwell's art has opened, uh, not just for me, but for people everywhere. And it's one of the things that makes it so, has such staying power and so enjoyable. I took the concepts of the Four Freedoms to Ethiopia earlier this year as a guest of the State Department who wanted to invite Ethiopian artists to paint their rendition of freedom in Ethiopia. And 180 artists presented work or submitted works to the juried competition, 250 artworks that showed freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom to worship, and freedom from fear. And their interpretations were at once very different from Norman Rockwell's and also very much the same in terms of these being President Roosevelt's ideals of what every human being has a right to, food security and safety and uh, the safety of your children, tucking them into bed. And so there were wonderfully creative um, versions from Ethiopian artists, and we joined them, and they and a, a selection of 25 of them went on view in the U.S. Embassy in Addis Ababa. Two weeks after coming home, the uh, revolutions um, for freedom started in Tunisia and Egypt, and you know, bursting all over that region. And our country was using Norman Rockwell to for cultural diplomacy to bring the idea of freedom to a nation that is largely free, but is not fully free to speak. Their press is constrained. Um, so Rockwell's work has uh, just such staying power and such um, opens so many worlds. But it seems that you're talking about yourself opening so many worlds as well. It's almost a meditation of Rockwell and his museum and his works and his influences uh, seems to have affected you in a very personal way. I think I was struck personally by his work when I first engaged with it uh, during a summer during college because I was a, an art history major and a student of art and I had experienced classes where professors, if they even included Rockwell's work, were mocking it. Yes. And it was a transformative experience to go to the museum and see how moved our visitors were by looking at Rockwell's work, sometimes moved to tears. And this, to me, was such a dichotomy at you know, the young, passionate age when you're right. ready to take on the world. And I just thought, how can this be? How can this profession be spurning an artist who is touching so many people's lives? And so my first work with the museum was to catalog uh, and document what he had painted. There was no record. No one knew the extent to which he had been so prolific. And we cataloged nearly 4,000 works. And so rooted in that scholarship, I really, uh, after 10 years of working on that catalog raisonné, was invited to build the new museum and uh, lead the collection to its future home, which was just another tremendous project of both long duration, but in connecting many, many people to Rockwell's work. And as we broadened to put him into the field of American illustration, uh, that again was a field that was largely uh, not recognized by the art world as uh, it was really a second cousin, and it was untapped. And I, what I discovered were hundreds and hundreds of important artists who had really made tremendous contribution to our visual culture in America. And I have wonderful colleagues at the museum. Our chief curator, Stephanie Plunkett, is uh, passionate about illustration art. And together, we've really blossomed the mission of the museum, uh, fully supported by a board of trustees that understood that Norman Rockwell would be better served and better understood if there were a context around his work. So is that the next phase of the museum's um, existence, is build out this collection thematically? Yes, what we're focused on now is building the collection, uh, curating exhibitions. We have three major 
exhibitions a year and usually four or five small thematic um, shows around Norman Rockwell's life or uh, some of our spotlight illustrator shows. We travel most of the exhibitions that we curate. So we have 17 different exhibitions touring around the country. And over the last seven, eight years, we've built partnerships with museums all over the nation who now are presenting illustration art and in some cases beginning to collect it. And when we formed the Rockwell Center for American Visual Studies three years ago, it was conceived as a partnership network between museums with important collections of American illustration. And the idea was you could create a virtual campus and a really a national collection oh, of American illustration art without having to build a big building. I think the internet and technology today makes things possible that weren't possible before and we don't need to be all about buildings to both uh, connect people to art and help uh, the scholarship and the research and the presentation that uh, we love to do as museums. And so that's really been the other big push of our museum the past eight years as we've been digitizing our collection. We have all of the art collection uh, scanned and, and now we've been working on the archive. There are about 40,000 records and it is now uh, online and available uh, through our website on the internet so people can either study, do research, or just enjoy all the Rockwell art. And how, how many people visit the museum a, uh, annually? Our visitation is around 130,000 people a year. Uh, we're in the Berkshire Hills right. in western Massachusetts, a beautiful region of the country, but it's very seasonal. We tend to have our high visitation and summer and fall foliage, a great cultural festival in the summer with Tanglewood and the Boston Symphony Orchestra, Jacob's Pillow, and wonderful museums and theater. And then in the, the slower season, we share our collection. That's when we, we have a lot of demand for um, the Rockwell collection, largely because museums weren't collecting his work, and now they would very much like to present it. So we do. We feel that's an obligation of a national collection is to share it. And how do you develop the financial wherewithal to support all of your programs? Well, we have to be very creative with fundraising. We our our capitalization is uh, very small. We have a modest reserve fund and do not yet have an endowment. But the federal grant programs have been uh, and and national policy have been very supportive of building out the digital connectivity of the nation's museums and libraries. So we've been successful with the National Endowment for the Arts and Humanities, Save America's Treasures, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and recently the National Archives Records Administration, uh, because there is a tremendous push to, for digital learning and 21st century learners to be able to connect to our nation's information. And I think we just were ready to do the project and hit it at the right time um, about eight, nine years ago. So we have a lot of content now, and we've been able to not only share it online, but really use it as a platform to uh, repurpose and share in other ways, from exhibition to publication to scholarly research, the uh, wonderful exhibition that was held last year at the Smithsonian of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas's Rockwell's. Uh, much of the research for the catalog was done at our museum and through the Rockwell Archive. So it's had um, many applications, and now we'll be able to uh, really connect with new audiences, both virtually as well as those who can visit. Well, a great artist who made tremendous contributions to the uh, art and to the dialogue that uh, occurs within our society. Laurie, thank you so much for your insights, and, and thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mark.